Okay, let me tell you a little bit about our speaker here that we're going to be interviewing, John Firth. He's an author, he's a speaker, he's an independent consultant and business coach living in Brooklyn, New York. He specializes in, in developing disruptive and innovative business models, marketing strategies, and business development projects. He's spoken at the Harvard Club in New York. Have you ever been there? It's a beautiful, what is that? Oh, it's a cop car. I thought somebody <laughs> coming to get me. <laughs> By the way, just to interject, I'll be holding the presentation ver version of this interview at the Harvard Club wow. next week. Anybody been to the Harvard Club in New York? That's where we hold our meeting. Beautiful, beautiful place. I mean, it's really, that's where we had Steve Forbes uh, speak many years ago. Anyway, he's, he's spoken at the Harvard Club, the Waseda Marketing Forum in Tokyo, the National Press Club in DC, IBM's Global Innovation Outlook, NPR, National Public Radio, and in front of many, many different trade groups. John's been uh, extensively quoted in publications such as the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, and Bloomberg Business Week. He also does an online column. Guy is busy, I can tell you that, for the New York Daily News and entrepreneur.com. In addition to that, he blogs on topics relating to leadership, such as celebrating independence, learning when to let go, very, very important talk. We're learning when to let go, especially of your and business. And what to let go of. We're going to get to that. Mm -hmm. Today's virtual leaders is another topic. And strategy and effective leader. John has spent 25 years as an external as well as internal consultant, holding senior positions as the head of strategy groups at Hitachi Consulting, Discovery Communications, and Sony Corporation. And last year, he published his first book, which we have over there, and he's going to be, after the talk, he'll be back there signing books if you're interested in buying one. Published his first book entitled Owning Tomorrow, The Unstoppable Force of Disruptive Leadership. Part of a summary of what he's learned for the last 30 years working with the executives, and part guidebook leading to success in one of the most disruptive business environments he feels in the history of mankind. And we're going to get into that, too. He has his undergraduate degree from Harvard, or as they say up there, Harvard. Harvard. <laughs> and he has an MBA from the Stern School of Business at New York University. It's a great, great school. John, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. Great to have your family here, your mother from Cadenville, my old stopping ground. <laughs> Love Cadenville. You know, we're going to talk about disruption. We're going to talk about the Amazons and the Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, people that really made huge differences in the marketplace in the world of business. But let's start first, I guess, with a definition of terms. Give us a definition from what you feel. How do you define disruption? Um, <clears throat> great place to start. Um, so disruption has a lot of negative connotations, um, which is why I still say don't use disruption as a word in your tagline or your marketing plan. Um, but it is a force of transformation. In fact, most transformations of the human experience have been through disrupting a system, a process, an industry. Um, now, in the last 30 years, it's also proven to be the best way to make multi-billion multi billionaires very quickly. So if you think of Mark Zuckerberg, mm. who isn't really that disruptive, but he, um, it's probably disruptive in proving that before 30 you can make Forty Huge. billion dollars, <laughs> um, um, Amazon. So Jeff Bezos, uh, this translation of the value that they create through a disruptive activity that puts out underperforming companies or individuals out of business is proving to be the best way to not only transform the world but to make lots of money. Talk and there's a lot of pain that goes with it too, because you're putting people out of out of business. Um, right whole regions of, of, of our country have been decimated through disruption, or the economic and financial power has shifted. But it is, again, probably the reason why we're sitting here with microphones and good food in a well air conditioned room. environment. I guess we saw that many years ago with Walmart, way back when, when they started expanding like crazy. Mm -hmm. you know, And they started putting people out of business. And then people found a way to combat that and we're able to stay in business. But tell us, what makes a business leader, say, a disruptive leader? Mm -hmm. What do they do that, say, other people don't do? What are the characteristics? Um, well, there is, a, in my book, I talk about certain traits. Um, I would say, first of all, you actually have to want to make change happen. 
um, and I'm speaking specifically to mostly small and medium-sized business owners here, I assume, and you have to want to transform something, whether it's your company, or through an internal series of, of disruptions, again, where you look at IBM, what Gerstner did there 25 years ago that was highly disruptive, 25% of the workforce got fired and he had to turn around a company that was about to be bankrupt. You have to look at the marketplace and say, something's not working for the consumers, either because uh, it's very expensive, the product, and it could be made much cheaper, what Henry Ford did for the car, um, uh, batch process or f batch fermentation of penicillin, where you're actually taking something that's uh, very valuable, very expensive, and hard to get a hold of, and making it what I call democrat democrat democratizing it. You're making it available cheaper and, and easier for the average person to get. Um, and then, of course, there's the big disruptions like Amazon and so forth, where you understand that the system that is providing, in his case, books, um, is highly fragmented. It's uh, not reaching billions of people as it should. And so using a very simple technology that already existed, he didn't develop the technology. He was able to found Amazon and immediately started making money. So it's also just literally looking for an opportunity to do something different that will resonate with consumers and bring value to their lives. How was he able, how was Jeff Bezos able to corner the market like that? That was in the mid 90s, I think. When yeah, he started in 1994, 25 years ago. I mean, and he didn't make money, my understanding, he didn't make money in the beginning, and he um, invested a ton of money. But if you could pinpoint one or two things that he really did to turn that, or was it just a waiting game, being at the right place at the right time? Um, well, he's, first of all, a very smart man. Uh, also, he had been successful as a hedge fund manager in Wall Street. So he had um, and a good education from, from Princeton, which is no case school. Um, <laughs> Not as good as Harvard. Not as good as Harvard. <laughs> we do have a few Harvard graduates who are great disruptors. Unfortunately, two of them didn't bother getting their degree, Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates. But um, uh, So with him, uh, as I understand it, he started doing quite well, actually. He used a piece of software that Bantam Books had made available to anybody who wanted it with the option of buying five books and being able to return four of them. So he immediately saw, in Wall Street terms, an arbitrage opportunity. I understood that he started making $20,000 a day pretty fast. Wow. Uh, in fact, he was one of the few companies, he did go through some series A's and B's to get the financing he need pre-IPO, but he's one of the few companies that, as he was going out looking for initial funders, could prove that he had revenue generation. LinkedIn, for example, didn't when uh, Reed, Hast uh, Reed Hoffman started going out looking for money. But Amazon had at least a revenue model that made investors more comfortable with him. And just expanded like crazy. You know? Right, just he's, he's a very smart guy and very, very savvy about organizations. In fact, that's probably the greatest thing he brings is, as a CEO is understanding it's about growing the organization as the business grows. And uh, I actually interviewed once for a, a leadership development position there. And the, I didn't interview with him directly, but he clearly knows what it takes to grow, and he's focused totally on growing the organization, and the business follows. And he values his people like Jack Welch did? He values his people, but more importantly, he, <laughs> on one hand, he values them, on the other hand, he puts them through incredible rigorous um, reviews, uh, especially the business unit heads, and a lot of business unit heads don't make it through those reviews. Um, he knows his business for as huge, as huge as it is, he knows it very well and expects his business unit um, heads to know it better, and if they don't, they're gone. Yeah, it's similar to Jack Welch. It grew GE to market cap, what, at $350 billion. Right. And if, I mean, people read Jack's first book straight from the gut. I mean, it's a great book. I mean, he had a great quote in there, you know, mm -hmm. your biggest assets walk in the door every day as employees, not your biggest liabilities. But again, it's the same thing. He made sure that, you know, you hit your numbers uh -huh. or, you know, you were gone. Yeah. I mean, it was yeah. simply, it was, a, you know. Well, he called himself the best paid human resources director in the world. That's how he referred to himself. I thought it was so fascinating in that book. The book was 506 pages, I believe. Do you know how many, you know how much ink he, he, he allotted to his first wife? Anybody take a guess? Three paragraphs. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a whole other story there. <laughs> Anyhow, back to our discussion. <laughs> when you talk about valuing people when you value things, I mean, you got to, you know, sometimes you got to value both things, not, in, not only at home, but, you know, at the office. Do you too. know, I get, I get asked about Jack Welch almost every time I get interviewed. 
and he's not in the book. And the more I think about it, he probably should be included. Yeah. <laughs> Very That's interesting. Book two. Yeah, this is book number two. I've got a lot of stuff for book number two. <laughs> You work with a lot of CEOs, you know, small companies, up to giant companies. And what do you do? I mean, people have great ideas, but what do you do to make sure they succeed in these crazy disruptive times? Well, um, what really makes disruptive disruption the, or what people think of when they think of disruption is they think of the idea. Everybody immediately assumes it's a great idea that time has come. And that's partially true. And there's a whole section of my book where I go through how you develop disruptive ideas, how you know what to bite off when it's too much or not enough. Um, uh, in the case of two of the greatest disruptors, although one of them's a problem figure, Travis Kalanick of Uber and Jeff Bezos, is they found very fragmented industries. There were no really huge players that they had to disrupt to be successful. In some ways, they were almost a consolidator of those industries. Um, book publishing and distribution on one hand, and taxi and limousine services. Um, Elon Musk, on the other hand, decided to go after two of the biggest, most powerful industries in the world, oil and gas and automotive. And no wonder he's still got a question mark if he's been successful or not. So the ideas are there. Uh, it is really about the implementation of the idea. That's, that's really what separates the would-be disruptors from the successful. Um, and I think it's not any news to people that really, certainly as business owners, execution is what the game's all about. And so I think uh, where you've got a lot of successful uh, entrepreneurs, such as Bezos and um, uh, Charles Schwab, I know there are a lot of wealth managers here, um, and others is they knew how to execute. And it had to do with hiring the right people, being able to plan, being able to really understand the consumer value proposition, which is, as I said, first of all, taking goods that are available only to a few at a very high price and making them cheaper, more available to the average person, solving problems. And then, of course, my favorite, which is delighting the consumer, simply doing something innovative and different so the consumer is so excited and interested that they immediately jump on board, whatever that might mean, getting products cheaper, uh, getting them and getting, having them arrive exactly when you want them and so forth. But it's really the execution. It's first of all being able to get the capital to start, so your idea and the way you present it, probably more the way you present it than the idea itself, to attract the capital you need and then to attract the best talent. And once you have that, then you have to really, as Chef Bezos has proven, focus on the nuts and bolts of the business. And that usually means systems, processes, and organization. Great, great point. I mean, there's a, if people would like to read, there's another great book out. It's called Execution by Larry Bossidy. Mm -hmm. And he was also one of the you know, General Electric people under Jack Welch. But it's exactly right. You've got to make sure the job gets done. You, know, you can have the greatest idea, the greatest staff, you can have greatest everything. If you don't follow through, it's not going to get done. Right. Which leads us to the concept, I guess, of internal uh, disruption. You know, what are some of the signs, if you will, that a company needs to be disrupted? How do they go about it? And what are some of the best pro practices to make that happen? Well, it, it's interesting because the first thought I have is obviously financial performance, but that's not actually always the case. In the case of IBM, clearly um, they had to get rid of John Akers because he had pursued a strategy that was obviously failing big time. Um, and uh, probably in the most disruptive decision a, a board has ever made, they reversed course 180% and hired Lou Gerstner to be the CEO, who was not an obvious choice. He was Harvard, kind of, Harvard man. Uh, he's the one Harvard graduate <laughs> who I could put in the realm of great disruptors. Um, and uh, he himself didn't know why they had chosen him. Um, and in his book, um, Teaching Elephants to, no, that's another book. Yeah, no, I think it's Teaching Elephants to Walk or to Dance. Uh, he says, you know, you literally had to go on vacation to figure this out, whether or not he <laughs> wanted to take on the challenge. Um, but he did, and it became fairly evident very quickly why the board chose him. He was a great strategist, and he immediately recognized that he had to absolutely ditch the old strategy immediately. And he was a great organizational guy. So he also had to get rid of 25% of the workforce that wasn't working in a major disruptive activity. But as we know, he turned around an almost bankrupt company this close. And the market capitalization, I think, rose 10 times what it had been when he started, and that was only four years later. So, by the way, that was also 1994 when he started turning around IBM. I think you're getting the sense that 1994 was kind of a key moment. The other one is a Harvard-related thing. 
Harvard professor Clayton Christensen, Harvard Business School, started laying the foundations for the intellectual academic understanding of disruption, of which Jeff Bezos was a huge fan. So that's two for Harvard, one for Princeton. <laughs> How about that? And just as a side note, Lou Gerstner was a classmate of our founder, Joe Mancuso, oh. of the CEO Club. Mm -hmm. And uh, Joe talks very highly about oh, him. Oh, yeah. He's, he was, well, he's one of the great disruptors, although albeit internal disruption and not external market disruption. It brings us to the point that, you know, a lot of people have great ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of those ideas are disruptive ones like we're mm -hmm. talking about. How do you go about assessing whether it's a good idea to follow through with or it's not? Because it seems to be, again, it's that thin line that we're talking about. And if you cross that line the wrong way, bad things could happen. You could just do one thing wrong and, um, and you can suddenly be destroying value very quickly. Um, that's one of my favorite topics, which is how do you actually tell? How can you know that an idea might work if you can implement it? I think first and foremost, if you can't explain it simply and easy for people to understand, you're going to have a problem right there. It's got to be something that you can make really Joe on the street understand fairly quickly, i.e., you don't have to stand on a, um, on a corner in rain hailing a cab. Just get on the telephone, and you can order one, and it'll be there within five minutes. Easy to understand. Um, I think the other thing is many people think it's all about the technology. It is, obviously, because the internet, the reason why it's so disruptive these days is because of the internet, the single most disruptive technology since the printing press, and having the same effect, nor only about 1,000 times more, more pervasive. I mean, the printing press obviously carried through a lot of disruption. Unfortunately, Gutenberg did not become a billionaire with the printing press, <laughs> so he can't be a great disruptor um, because you have to make lots of money. Um, uh, so. Uh, that's one of the things. Easy to understand technology. It's about using existing technologies. These guys are not inventors. They're businessmen that look to delight the consumer or solve a problem and so forth. But they use technology that's already out there. Bill Gates did not even, I mean, he thought of the operating system, but he knew that was a place he could be disruptive. And because he was such a great businessman and visionary, literally <coughs> looking forward, he was able to take a piece of technology from another company that he bought for like $70,000 or something. And yeah, he was at one point the wealthiest man in the world. He didn't invent anything. So don't think you have to invent. You have to actually have a really profound understanding of what, for lack of a better term, the marketplace, consumers, customers are not getting and what technology could be doing to enable it and find a business model that's probably foreign to that industry. Um, you know, the obvious one is taking sort of a membership type of business model that locks people in and start applying it to all sorts of other industries, um, uh, just as an example. And I think the, um, the last one is timing. You gotta get the timing right. These things don't, nobody lives in a vacuum. So if your idea is easy and simple to explain, but everybody goes, what? <laughs> it could be a good sign, but it could also be a sign that you're going to have real trouble actually getting people to understand why they should move to you. Um, the people who make it difficult for themselves are the ones who get stuck on the technology. If you get really into the technology of it, guaranteed it's not going to work. You've got to be able to relate it back to the consumer really quickly. Uh, and then, yeah, you have to be able to build the organization around it. It was interesting. You talked about Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. You know, if you the biography of Jobs. I mean, I thought it was so fan uh, fascinating. Like you said, Jobs didn't create it. Gates didn't create it. It was created by Xerox. And Jobs stole that from Xerox, and then Gates stole it from Jobs. Right. I mean, it was, you talk about a circular route. So again, it's being at the right place at the right time. They said they had the 10,000 10, hours you become proficient at something, whether mm -hmm. it's sports, whether it's technology, whether it's whatever it is. Mm -hmm. right. And that was the whole trail. Yeah, it's, well, as I always say, good poets create, great poets steal. And I would say pretty much every disruptor, I wouldn't say stole a technology, but they used somebody else's invention. Sarnoff, the founder of RCA, basically literally ripped the TV out of the hands of the inventor of the TV. And there's even plays about it. I mean, it was pretty vicious. But he built RCA on the back of that TV. I mean, it was so fascinating, too, because I remember one confrontation Jobs had with Gates and Jobs was going to sue Gates, and Gates said, what are you talking about? You stole it from Xerox. Why are you going to sue me for stealing it from you? <laughs> right. I mean, it was just yeah. crazy. Yeah. 
I'm going to ask one more question, then I'll open it up to the audience. You know, there are so many, I'm sure, great ideas, like you're talking about. There's a mm -hmm. lot of great ideas. You've got to have the timing. You've got to have the market. You've got to have the technology and so forth. Somebody may have a great idea, say, internally in a company, mm -hmm. but still it fails. Mm -hmm. How do you draw that line? Why does it happen like that? Is it just the wrong place at the wrong time? Well, that gets into the whole topic of, of uh, how close a disruption, a disruptive activity that could be successful can become destructive. Um, so I'm going to change the answer a little bit, which is actually to address that. Why do some people, why, do, why are they successful and when successful, highly successful, you know, making billions of dollars for themselves, for their investors and so forth, and why some people, because of one or two major mistakes, uh, are in the dustbin of uh, the rogues gallery, gallery of destructors, I call them. And there are three members of that uh, that you probably know. First one is Travis Kalanick at Uber. And he did not understand how to grow an organization. And so he had a startup culture even when he had 12,000 employees. Wow. And it was uh, no holds bar, very aggressive, go after it, which was fine when he was getting started and why they were so successful. But at 12,000 people, there are <coughs> definitely employees who are not going to look at that kind of culture very, uh, very favorably. And so there were lawsuits, discrimination lawsuits, and so forth. Uh, that then, then the municipalities that had disrupted, had played the game to disrupt the taxi and limousines, got cold feet and started either threatening to pull the licenses or in some cases actually pulled their licenses. And that was a downward spiral. And so he had, was forced to resign two and a half years ago. And the, the, um, success, his successor still hasn't fixed the business model. They're still unprofitable. They had an IPO four or five months ago. It's now 20% lower than it was. And the market is easily 10 or 15% higher. So obviously, he destroyed value. And they're still trying to figure out how to do that. Uh, my favorite, and I'm sorry that she's a woman, but she is a woman, is Elizabeth Holmes. Oh, and you know, but yeah, <laughs> that's, uh, I could say, denial is not just a river in Egypt. That was a woman who was <laughs> totally in denial. Anybody know who she is? Yes. Founder of Ther Theranos. Ther Ther Theranos. Theranos. Yeah. Um, and my third one is a man who I worked for briefly, Howard Stringer, who took over the leadership of Sony. Uh, and under his leadership, and I had left long before that, the stock lost 75% of its value. He had no clue about consumer electronics. So you have Kalanick, who clearly didn't understand how to build an organization. You have Elizabeth Holmes, who from the very beginning wasn't listening to anybody and felt that being tunnel visioned was the way to go, which is exactly a sign that it's not going to work. Uh, if you get into this tunnel vision, um, it's pretty much the kiss of death, no matter what you do. And um, Howard Stringer, who just, he really wasn't into it. I had a meeting once where he had gotten a letter from the chairman of the board inviting him to become CEO because they were asking the guy who, who hired me to resign. And Howard's first, because Howard had restructured and turned around the Americas. And he said, you know, I don't know if I want to be the CEO. I want to be the chief restructuring officer, but not the CEO. Hmm. He just wasn't that into it. And it showed. Interesting. Any questions from the audience? I got Steve. One. Uh, knowing that California is a very, very friendly state to business. <laughs> Sorry. At least to disruptors. Stuff you're talking about, uh, knowing that California now is changing the rules on our four, our four friends at Uber, uh, you've read that, uh, that. So are they doomed, bottom line? That's a really interesting question, um, and I can't think of who the current CEO is. He used to be, I think he was the CEO of Orbitz beforehand. Um, it's really begin contingent on him. There are just so many problems that Kalanick left behind that he hasn't been able to solve. He definitely attacked the organizational problem, but that, of course, even though that's one of the precursors to success, if he can't get the business model to work, and that includes keeping his clients happy, after all, that's not the first thing of ever of any, any rule of success is think about your customers, your consumers, or your clients. And basically, the municipality, um, a little bit like insurance and healthcare, call the shots. And if they pull a license or if they right. make it difficult, same thing's happening to um, Airbnb and some of these right. disruptive yeah. um, housing and hotel services. Yeah, I, I, if I had to call a shot is, I think if it's a decline, it'll be a slow burn decline. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Suzanne. Uh, quick question. So in thinking about your definition of disruptor, 
would you go so far as to say that um, McDonald's, that whole concept? Yes, Ray Kroc is in my pantheon of great disruptors. And, Absolutely. And yet he didn't come out as the bad guy. I mean. Technically, mm. technically, he did. Yeah, but, in the movie. Um, <laughs> you know, from an image perspective, once the movie came out, of course, his image was changed. Mm -hmm. But from a brand perspective, he was able to maintain a very strong brand. What's, mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the key? Well, I think you said it right there. One of them is, is never uh, not let your brand, your personal brand, and the brand of your product suffer in any way. And let's face it. A lot of these men steal things. I think the movie pointed that out in case, right. case of Ray Kroc. But the other thing is to draw some analogies, and I almost never do it, but I'm going to do it now, uh, with Trump and everything swirling around him. He manages to not get pulled into a lot of messy situations. He just now, he's highly controversial, which, by the way, most disruptors are. You know, Jeff Bezos has been through the ringers every, because of the destruction that comes before the transformation. Um, You've got to be made of Teflon. Things have got to um, come off of you. Um, the other thing I think you alluded to at one point was philanthropic activities. Mm -hmm. Ray Kroc's widow spent all of their money on philanthropic good activities. So I think at the end, you can say Ray Kroc had his heart in the right place. Some of the maneuvering was probably not so pretty and some of the destruction. But remember, he took hamburger joints that were barely eking a living out and gave them the opportunity to become millionaires buying into a system. So at the end, it was good work he did. Now, whether or not you like the food he was serving is another question. <laughs> but not even quite, that, they're starting to change. So. Not quite Harbor Court. Steve. Yeah, what about challenges on, on businesses for franchising? Oh, my god. Um, <laughs> um, considering I considered franchises, um, how do I say this? So my experience with franchises have been my father, who passed away several years ago, was a great lawyer. And uh, he, I would show him the drafts of franchises that, or the contract. And he would make his comments and he'd come back of, no change, we're not going to accept this. And he said, don't do it. He said, That's, that it's all worded in such a way that they care first about themselves and their brand. So I think the first disruption that might happen is franchisees need to get a little bit, or franchisors need to get a little more aware of what the franchisees really need. Um, you know, McDonald's has done a great job of that. Um, uh, some of the others, I mean, that's really sort of, again, one of the innovations for Ray Kroc is he made in such a way that those who came on board were going to transform and do well. University, support, everything they needed. So, you know, he took the franchise model that had been around for quite a while and applied it with some tweaks. And that's the example of bringing a other business model into an industry that hasn't thought that way before. Joe. So in that category, then, would you say Chick-fil-A is a disruptor in that, in that food category? I haven't really thought about Chick-fil-A. Um, Probably not, because the model had already been so successful at McDonald's. So the disruptor was Ray Kroc. Chick-fil-A really didn't do anything different in the sense of the business model, the technology, the supply chain, the cleanliness, all the things that really Ray Kroc was the pioneer in. So I would, I'd have to say no. But he probably tweaked it a little bit. Yeah, tweaked the, it a little the... bit. Yeah. And by the way, tweaking can make all the difference in the world. In fact, uh, the, the big thing that Jeff Bezos, who really intellectually also is superior to most of his fellow CEOs in understanding what he's doing and being able to articulate, said more stays the same than changes in disruption. So sometimes it is just a minor change, what looks like a minor change to a business model or to an industry that this has immense effect. Along that same line, Starbucks, I guess. Would you put them in that category? I mean, I, he, Howard sort of... Schultz definitely was more of a disruptor, but I think he was a disruptor in how we viewed coffee, how we thought about coffee, which, of course, is a major disruption. Because 20 years ago, I don't think anybody would have necessarily said Starbucks. I mean, I still like Dunkin' Donuts coffee, but, um, <laughs> For a dollar, but right? it was bitter. It was, and he managed to get us to accept it as, as a taste that we preferred. And so in some ways, I wouldn't say he's a major disruptor, but he definitely disrupted our beliefs about coffee. And tweaked it. Anybody else? Questions? What about, uh, John, what about, what do you see as the next marketplace, if you will? I mean, they, they talked about the stock market. That one stock that came out went down 20%. Just recently, the company Beyond Meat, which I'm sure you're probably mm -hmm. familiar mm -hmm. with, 
it, it, I would think is a disruptor in the marketplace. Stock came out, doubled, and then went up almost eight times. The biggest run up in the almost the history of the market in the last 10, 15 years. It's unbelievable. Right. My daughter works for that company. I couldn't get stock. I was really down. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, is that the next marketplace? I mean, is that, do you see that as a disruptor? Uh, why, did it, why did it go up so much, in your opinion? Well, again, I'm, I'm not, our wealth managers can probably tell you much more about the stock market, which has a life of its own. By the way, that was something Jeff Bezos, having worked on Wall Street, was great at. When he was reinvesting money and not profitable, he knew exactly how to work with Wall Street so that he didn't get, his stock didn't get hit. Um, that was another skill set that very few great CEOs know, which is how do you talk to Wall Street? Uh, Lou Gerstner also knew how to talk to Wall Street. Um, and uh, Kalanick obviously didn't. And by the way, Mark Zuckerberg almost fell short of that when he showed up in a hoodie to disrupt <laughs> people dressed like us and make him very aware that he was Mark Zuckerberg, who was going to wear a hoodie to a dinner or a luncheon with the major bankers. And uh, he almost got crucified there. but. But, he turned you know, everybody's the smart guys. But look at Jobs. Jobs did the same thing with his dungarees and his white or black shirt. <laughs> I mean, that's all he wore. Yeah, but I doubt, though, when he went into a room of bankers Back that then. I'm sure he modified his behavior somewhat, whereas Mark Zuckerberg, I mean, he was 25, 26. I mean, you know, talk about time to make mistakes in your 20s. But he survived. I don't know if he's going to survive the next one that he's going through now, but it's going to be a tough one. Peter or Tom, what's your thoughts? Why does a stock like that go up? You know, the stock that, that John talked about went down 20% after it came public. What, why does a stock like that, is it because it's new in the marketplace and keep on running? I mean, it's, you know, it's just, it's unbelievable. Oops, that's my phone. <laughs> Thanks. Peter or Tom? I don't, I'm just, I don't want to follow the stock specifically, but. Okay, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> you just disrupted yourself. Yeah, I'm aware of the stock uh, and it, it's, been mind blowing. I don't think anyone can give an explanation as to why it's gone up that much, but obviously it's demand and supply, right? And, and uh, um, consumers love that whole concept. It was disruptive, and it is the way we feel these days about looking for something beyond meat. Um, and so it completely took off. But, but look at so many of these ideas that have gone the other way, and it's just, you know, what's the appetite? Look at um, WeWorks right now. It is yeah. just falling on their faces because they, they haven't been able to do it the right way. Right, so, right. They're still not they're profitable. Still right. not profitable. Right, exactly. right. It used to be that profit counted for something. <laughs> yeah, well, it I does know. in the long run. I yeah, does, yeah. I, I think if you look at a stock's performance over just a couple of days or weeks, that doesn't really tell you much. But if you look at it at six, 12 months, two years, then you get the story. And that's when profitability counts. Uh, and the ability to tell the story. So again, being able to tell Wall Street what it wants to hear in a way they want to hear it and not have to wear a hoodie to make a, an impression. I think we went through that in the late 90s where most of these companies had no valuation, there was no earnings, and I kind of get the feel that we're kind of slipping back into that world now, which is what scares me a little bit of where we are right. in the market. Well, the problem is, is these stories, when they get told, uh, delight consumers. It's a disruptive activity. They're, they, they, it gets momentum, and then consumers want to get it because it's going to make them tons of money. So they're highly delighted and excited and uh, can't get the stock when they want to get it, and it just ratchets it up. Uh, exactly. Right. It's, 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 it's quite honestly a disruptive. So yeah. It's, it's, how, it's part of this whole question of how do CEOs survive some of this stuff is you know, in some cases you actively have to pursue a PR strategy that does exactly that. I, I know a woman who um, does art, which she specializes taking little known artists who have great work and doing the PR that's necessary so that a collector can go from having a couple half a million dollar pieces to having, you know, half a billion dollar collection. She, that's her business. Is she wow. goes out and she does, she burnishes the image of, 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 of an artist gets publications and so forth, so that the collector who hires her to do that will make money. That's also highly disruptive. And I think businesses do that all the time. Denise. Um, how do you see, uh, we were having a conversation about how with the internet, I mean, it's been around for a long time, but it really is changing recently that everything is commoditized now. And, um, you know, 
where do you see that going? I mean, it seems like it's reaching some pinnacle. Peak. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. Actually, that may even answer the question you posed. So what I think is that I wouldn't say it's necessarily industry specific, but the experience, the non-digital experience is, is big, is a big differentiator now. You see it in retail all the time. You have to, you see it in, in healthcare. Um, uh, uh, many healthcare providers in New York are hiring outside experts, usually from the hospitality industry, mm. to come and teach hospitals, the whole staff, how to be patient-centric, which you think is what hospitals should be about, but they're not, um, for a whole variety of reasons. So I think the disruption is gonna look like more personal, immediate experiences on location. Um, and that, that is, for me, probably, that's disrupting this wave of digital technology, which indeed commoditizes a lot. So the question is, how do you decommoditize something? Well, you do something of huge value that the consumers immediately see, and this experiential part is, I think, what's gonna be the next disruptor. Anybody else? One final thing for me, communication. You know, how important is that? You know, you said Bezos uh, was able to communicate because he understood Wall Street. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Howard Schultz, I think, did a great job in, with communication as well. How important do you see that in terms of being part of the package? Well, as I said, first thing is never say you're disrupting anything. Let other people say you're doing that, but never say, I, well, by the way, an idea that's doomed to failure, if the um, CEO or the founder says, I'm going to disrupt this or that, that you can t pretty much say, don't go with him. You're not disrupting. You're providing incredible value. That then has a disruptive um, uh, effect. effect. Um, but I think, uh, so that's one rule. I think the other one is these are highly original communicators. So some of them are highly polished, like Lou Gerstner. Some of them are learning to be polished. But they also differentiate themselves in the fact that they are very lively personalities. They're charismatic in most part, although Bezos. Oh, by the way, I did a pictorial getting ready for my Harvard Club um, presentation of who I think the greatest disruptors. They're some of the ugliest group of men I've ever seen. <laughs> they're unbelievable. I mean, Bezos looks like Yoda or something. Yeah. Um, it's, they're really very ugly. So it's obviously not because of the way they look. But he had a good looking wife, too. <laughs> figured out. <laughs> yeah, right. So, um, uh, yeah, so the communication is sometimes counterintuitive. And to, again, close off with Mr. Trump, um, everything he does, his tweets and everything, is totally thought through, is totally strategic. It's just that the American people, for the most part, don't see that. But the way he communicates is highly original. He is very charismatic, if you will, also in negative ways. But his communication strategy is totally a strategy. It's not his willfulness. It is him trying to deflect constantly uh, trying to rally supporters. I mean, it's totally thought through. There's not nothing left to chance with Trump and his disruptive communications. Yeah, he was at the, the Harvard Club with Steve Forbes. Like we said, we were there many years mm -hmm. ago, and he took up the whole room. I got to tell you that. Whether oh, you like him or you hate him, you know, he takes Everybody up the whole that. room. Yeah. John Firth, thank you so much. Thank great, you. great Thanks job.